Thank you, David. Um, thanks for coming. I want to say first that it's, uh, well, I read Susan Howe's work for the first time when I was 18 and living in Providence, and it just like tore a hole in time and space for me. It made this portal through which everything that was most kind of vital and wild that, about American literature could pass and, and be present. Um, so I'm honored to read in her company. I'm really grateful to whoever or, like thought to associate us. I think I benefit from the, from the conjunction. Um, and thanks to David, who also, I think this might be a secret, but he has this great long poem. I don't know if he shows it to people, but we, we should demand that it be, that it be published because it's terrific. I might have just ruined our friendship. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read one long poem to you. And when I'm in an audience uh, at a poetry reading and someone says that, I usually get a sinking feeling, but I think it's going to be OK. Uh, when I, a few years ago, I went to Marfa, Texas for a writer's residency. It's the only time I've ever gone to a residency. And I wrote this long poem there called The Dark Three Patches Down Upon Me Also, which is from Whitman. It's from Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. And I didn't know at the time that this novel, 1004, that David mentioned was going to kind of grow around it. It's the kind of the literal and figurative center of the book. There's a big excerpt of the poem in the book. Um, but I've never read that poem aloud, and tonight I thought if I did so, it would be a way of reading fiction and poetry simultaneously, since the poem is both inside and outside the novel, or part of it's in the novel, so this reading could kind of walk out of the fiction. Um, I mean, I, maybe I should say so. I, I mean, I, w I was in Marfa. I was reading the Library of America edition of Whitman. I was really obsessed with Specimen Days, this bizarre book of his. I, I don't know if you know it. And one of the things that I was really captivated by was the weird way in Whitman's uh, writing that he both claims to be doing the most important work imaginable, right? He's like writing the secular Bible of the United States. He's going to kind of make union actual. And then on the other hand, he's always just like loafing, his favorite word. And he's, he's like taking his ease under a flowering tree. And I, I thought that there was something about the relationship between labor and leisure in his work that was kind of like the contradictory logic of the residency itself, right? Where like you get this call and it's like we're going to give you a, a space away from your life in order to do the thing that supposedly is your life you know like that there's a there's a weird way that you have to be taken out of the world in order to make your work is it labor is it leisure that was one thing that you'll hear in the poem and then another thing is that Robert Creeley um, died in Marfa at a residency or started to die there and I was looking across the street to the the house where he was an important figure for me. I understand tomorrow in Buffalo there's an event to honor him. So like, I was listening to recordings of Creeley and rec the one recording of Whitman and reading those poems, and you'll hear that. Uh, I don't know if any of that needed to be said exactly, but it's too late. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, I'm just going to read you this, this poem. Um, it'll take 15 minutes or so. It was not my intention to travel in time, watch him distribute dried fruit and sweet crackers to soldiers in hospital, small sums, writing their letters. This was back when you might take it to a cousin to be read under a cut glass lamp. Why do articles fall out over time or get put back in? Is that a good question for the poet if I meet him abroad, aboard one of several no longer extant fairies? I am an alien here with a residency, light alien to me, true hawks starting from the trees at my footfall on gravel, sunburnt from reading specimen days on the small porch across the street from where another poet died or began dying. Some residents request it, others request not to be assigned it. I made no requests, but still end up traveling by tram across wartime Manhattan when the bridge was probably the tallest structure. No, it wouldn't be completed until, wouldn't have been completed yet. Those are still my favorite tenses, moths around street lights, obscuring the casualty lists I'm trying to read aloud to citizens in formal dress, address, attempting to stay cool and extant. 
I don't make any sense in the high desert, grip the yellow can with a toothed wheel, find instead of coffee, ash, particulate, but brew it and walk over with a cup for him, wake and reread the section about gifts. It might be worse to love both sides in a war, a general engagement in the woods, to speak of a wound's neighborhood as they remove splinters of bone, worse to admire singing through candlelit gauze than to ignore a wedding party struck by unmanned drones. I know no one involved except everyone, let alone love. They are dead for me in different ways, these poets, but I visit them both because a residency affords me time not sure where the money comes from or what money is, how you could set it beside a soldier's bed, then walk out across the moonlit mall in love with the federal, wake up refreshed and bring tobacco to those who haven't received wounds in the lung or the face. Tonight, I listened to their recordings at once in separate windows. Four lines from America might be recited by an actor, but the noise of the wax cylinder is real. Sounds how I imagine engines of old boats would, while the door incorporates distress into the voice, could be in the room. The former says he waits for me ahead, but I doubt I'll arrive in time. Even the phrase evening papers will need a gloss, like the notion presidents have features. Instead, I project myself back before carbon arc and mercury vapor, invisible labor of men in the dimly lit caisson, still a few years in the future, when the danger will be coming up too fast, nitrogen bubbles forming in the blood. I wanted to say I also passed through a series of airlocks en route to imperceptible work, even that a tower of a sort might be built upon it, but I'm more a supervisor, ill from surfacing quickly, watching its progress through a telescope, sending messages to the bridge site through my good wife, Emily. When completed, the celebration will surpass the one that marked the closing of the war, as if you could separate those things, as if those were things, cheap oak and iron deployed as inflation rages. My father studied briefly with Hegel, and there are other proper names we could summon, both Cranes, the one who lived in this apartment, drowned himself at my age, and the older one who died younger, having both seen and not seen war, but that's just the game of features again, when in fact the unwounded face is smooth. A thin crescent hangs over a Brooklyn where the rich still farm and I wait for your return from a war you love all sides of. Come back to the future where I'm resident and the phrase evokes one of the crucial movies of my youth. Set in 1955, the year nuclear power first lit up a town, Arco, Idaho, also home to the first meltdown, 1961, although years are part of the game. In the movie, they lack plutonium to power the time-traveling car, whereas in real life it seeps into the Fukushima soil. Back to the Future was ahead of its time, 1985, when I was six and the Royals took the series, in part because a ridiculous call forced Game 7 or to clearly out at first in replays. I can feel it getting away from me, so I leave the house, use the back door to avoid the other residents, and watch the sun set through smoke from Arizona fires, zero percent contained, wave to a woman bent over a row of yellow flowers, but she can't see me. I've faded from the photograph. We often say twilight but mean dusk, or check our watches without noting the time, two of the minor practices that make us enough of a people to believe that a raid on the compound can bring closure, depends what you think is ending. The gentle face of terror, civilian nuclear power, are those two things? There are men at work on the roof when I return, too hot to do by day, wave and am seen, an awkward exchange in Spanish, who knows what I said, having confused the conditional with imperfect. Norteño from their radio fills the house I hope they know isn't mine, I just write here, walk back out with a Brita and three glasses, but of course they have their own water, can I offer you a cup of ashes, can I interest you?
Soon, they move on to the house I call his because Douglas, who manages the compound, rushed him from there to hospital in Midland or Odessa, the roofer's purpose obscure to me, whose work is to chat with the dying or dead, to let them lay a pale hand on my knee if they still have hands, the practical nurses busy behind curtains, some of them singing popular hymns, often accompanied on melodeon, an accordion or small organ, strange to have either available among the cots and mosquito netting. It seems to be pleasurable for him when the moon makes radiant patches for a death-stricken boy to moan in or a patch of the wood ignites consuming soldiers too crippled to flee. Patch from the Latin pedeum, literally something measured compared to the medieval pedare to measure in feet. That might be false. The point is, he feels no need to contain his love for the material richness of their dying, federal body from which extremities secede, a pale beside the bed for that purpose, almost never mentions race, save to note there are plenty of black soldiers, clean black women would make wonderful nurses, while again and again I deliver money to boys with perforated organs, unionism to die with shining hair beside fractional currency, part of writing the greatest poem, or is the utopian moment loving the smell of shit and blood, brandy as it trickles through the wound, politics of pure sensation. When you die in the patent office, there's a pun on expiration. You must enter one of the immense glass cases filled with scale models of machines, utensils, curios, look. Your president will be shot in a theater Actors will be presidents. The small sums will grow monstrous as they circulate. Measure, I have come from the future to warn you. Tomorrow, I'll see the Donald Judd permanent installations in old hangars, but now it's tomorrow and I didn't go. Set out hatless in the early afternoon, got lost and was soon seeing floaters and spots a return to the house, the interior sea green until my eyes adjusted. I laid down for a while and dreamt I saw it. Tonight I'll shave, have two drinks with a friend of a friend, but that was last week and I canceled. Claimed altitude had sickened me a little. Can we get back in touch when I've adjusted? Yesterday, I saw the Donald Judd in a book they keep in the house, decided not to go until I finished a poem I've since abandoned, but will eventually pick back up. What I need is a residency within the residency. Then I could return refreshed to this one, take in Judd with friends of friends, watch the little spots of blood bloom on the neck so I'll know I've shaved in time, whereas now I'm as close to a beard as I've been, but not very close. Shaving is a way to start the workday by ritually not cutting your throat when you've the chance. Washes and razors for foo-foos, for me freckles and a bristling beard. A big part of reading him is embarrassment. Woke up today having been shaved in a dream by a nurse who looked like Falconetti, my cot among the giant aluminum boxes I still plan to see, then actually shaved and felt that was work enough for one day, my back to the future. The foundation is closed, Sundays and nights of which the residency is exclusively composed, so plan your visit well in advance or just circle the building where the Chamberlain sculptures are housed, painted in chromium-plated steel, best viewed through your reflection in the window. In Bastien La Paz's Joan of Arc, she reaches her left arm out, maybe for support in the swoon of being called, but instead of grasping branches or leaves, her hand in what is for me the crucial passage partially dissolves. It's carefully positioned on the diagonal sight line of one of three hovering translucent angels. He was attacked for failing to reconcile with the future saint's realism, a failure the hand presents as a breakdown of space, background beginning to swallow her fingers, reminding me of the photograph people fade from, the one Marty uses to measure the time remaining for the future in which we watched the movie. Only here it's the future's presence, not absence, that's eaten away at her hand. You can't rise from the loom so quickly that you overturn the stool and rush toward the plane of the picture without startling the painter. Here, voices the medium is powerless to depict without that registering somewhere on the body. 
but from our perspective, it's precisely where the hand ceases to signify a hand and is paint, no longer appears to be warm or capable, that it reaches the material present, becomes realer than sculpture because tentative, she is surfacing too quickly. This is why her face is in my dream, not hers but the beautiful actress that played her, also because in the film she recants her false confession, achieves transcendence only after her head is shaved. I'm embarrassed because there are workers on the roof for whom this is the north, and no one calls from beyond the desert frame except a poet or two. The conflict between two systems of incompatible labor endures, and the third is the flickering border between them, the almost work of taking everything personally until the person becomes a commons, a radical loafing that embraces the war because it also dissolves persons, a book that aspires to the condition of currency Warhol wanted to make a movie of specimen days. Some say the glowing spheres near Route 67 are paranormal. Others dismiss them as atmospheric tricks, static, swamp gas, reflections of headlights and small fires, but why dismiss what misapprehension can establish our own illumination return to us as alien, as sign? They've built a concrete viewing platform lit by low red lights which must appear mysterious when seen from what it overlooks. Tonight, I see no spheres but project myself and then gaze back, an important trick because the goal is to be on both sides of the poem, shuttling between the you and I. But what is the mystery he claims his work both does and doesn't contain? What does he promise, say we have silently accepted, cannot state, and how is it already accomplished as we read, and who is being addressed in the last stanza of Crossing Brooklyn Ferry? Form is always the answer to the riddle it poses, though there isn't much of one here, just a speaker emptied of history so he can ferry across it. Tide, wake, barge, flag, foundry, are things anyone could see, but no one in particular, less things than examples of things which once meant a public meeting place, assembly. Words are the promise he can't make in words without rendering them determinant and thereby breaking the promise because only when empty can we imagine assembly, not as ourselves, but as representatives of the selves he has asked us to dissolve, dumb ministers. These are the contradictory conditions of my residency in the poem where Adi isn't allowed to join me because she's from the world and what I miss most is the distortion, noise of the wax cylinder, the flaws in the medium that preserve what distance it closes, source of the glow I return to Creeley for. I wanted to include her daily reports on how the lavender held up throughout the heat wave, the dilated route where my aorta meets my heart, how I mistook two moths drawn to the flashlight for the eye shine of some animal approaching in the dark. Good to know that I can still feel an almost sexual terror on these meds. Then I had big plans for stinging ants as a figure of collectivity experienced as weird fact of the privileged residency, wasted a morning baiting them with apple, blushing hard when Douglas asked. Don't ask. The place where the intern's shoulder curves into her breast, the altitude-induced nosebleed that I slept through, beard of blood, and the bathroom mirror, terrible phrase, stuck in my head for a week, the chances of distance recurrent somewhere in my mother, small rain on the skylight, having learned to distinguish begging calls of baby swallows from the chatter of adults. A friend in California believes he is breathing in hot particles from Fukushima where a rabbit has been born without ears. Should I include that here along with the other casualties or will everything be leveled as soon as it appears in the catalog? My favorite part of the book, He's in Topeka and is supposed to read a poem to 20,000 people, instead decides to write a speech he fails to give because he's having a great time at dinner, so he just puts the speech in the book where we can read it at our leisure, makes you wonder if he actually sent the letter he included written to a dead soldier's mother, Whitman, poetry replaced by oratory addressed to the future, the sensorial commons abandoned for a private meal. 
If only there were more wandering away from the stage, less tallying one of his favorite verbs, I could turn to him now. But the reflection of his head is haloed by spokes of light. Cross is in the title, and there are other signs of a negative incarnation, paper heaven where the suffering is done by others. I've been worse than unfair. Although he was asking for it, is still asking for it, I can hear him asking for it through me when I speak despite myself to a people that isn't there, or think of art as leisure that is work in houses the undocumented build, repair. It's among the greatest poems and fails because it wants to become real and can only become prose, founding mistake of the book from which we've been expelled. And yet, look out from the platform See mysterious red lights move across the bridge in a Brooklyn I may or may not return to. Phenomena no science can explain. Wheeled vehicles rushing through the dark with their windows down, streaming music. Thank you. That's a hard introduction to follow. <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, I'm just thrilled to be uh, reading with Ben, and because uh, particularly what he just read, I love that part of the book that takes place in Marfa, and I love his use of Whitman, and of course, Robert Creeley, and um, I was very close to, to Bob, because we worked to get together for years in Buffalo. So I just sort of feel that this is a Bob is in the room, um, and thank you, Ben. It was wonderful. Um, also, I, f I feel like I'm a relic of the past, being born in 1937. With and Ben, you said you were born in '85. No, what? Earlier than that. But, but anyway, for me, you're the hope of the future, <laughs> and. Um, so you represent the not looking back, but looking forward with great excitement and joy. So um, I'll begin my reading um, and very briefly from a work in progress that I think will be called Depths, that's D-E-B-T-H-S, which is a word containing debt and deep at once and uh, hinging on the reversal of the letters B and P. Anyway, I, I may not call it that, but at this point, I think. Um, and I, now I found that in Finnegan's Wake. Anyway, what I'm going to read are two, are some very short pieces from um, this, uh, what will go in this book. And um, this, I'm reading from Tom Tit Tot 1 and Tom Tit Tot 2. And Tom Tit Tot is a, a Scottish variant of the Rumpelstiltskin uh, cycle of naming stories. Just, you don't really need to know that, but I'm telling you. Okay. Um, Crowded little monuments of paint, inch a space of scrutiny at. Scattered marks and loop off words from images thorn from their original source. History scattered to the fog of a page. It was you, play in combats of the playground. There are those of us who, oh, the grows leaf sown. A document, the parasitic, involve a structure of layer, age, placed on top of another, mm, its other, as if to infinite, portable ocean. Our mother of puddled images, fading away into deep blue polymer, seaweed, nets, shells, fish, feathers. Tom Tit Tot Two. Name, name, pudding and tame percipient agent, hidden will o' the wisp, nicked, not nothing. So long as one fact stands isolated and strange, one fact supported by no fact, 
wood slipper counter clatter. I can spin straw by myself. Once when the real world was our world in its nature to mind, our wood world. Threshold word, little hinge hope of bewilderment, its parchment, memory, sign. Each word may be six, six razzle rungs. It may be two places at once in the old secret escapades, a vault benediction for one lucky one under thimble thumb. You sit in our tent of belief and ask what to do with it. Faithful first, then frivolous. Half scientific, but good at guessing by sensation, you look at a flame. Is it orange within you or without you? These quiet stars, each free intelligence sealed from us. Days and hours are blinds. These screens, these means. Each new extreme outvies each quickening after, after. After the millennium, a little before, at brink, on the brink, humming octaves with wild trills of magic and symbolic logic, a knot being in the know. When stars are not so faint and new astronomers assign numbers, one may count one other, and each secretly jot down in units and tents for photometrics, other instant infinitesimal arc predicates, a nearest faint ghost alias. Now, uh, for the rest of the time, 25 minutes, I'll read um, passages uh, from a recent collection that this, um, and that, anyway, it consists of three sections, and I'm going to read parts of two of them. The first, uh, The Disappearance Approach, is a prose poem made from journal fragments I kept during the months immediately after the sudden death of my husband, Peter Hare. He had a pulmonary embolism. He was completely, perfectly healthy. And then he had this embolism and died in his sleep during the night of January 3rd, 2008. The day before, we'd gone in on, on the train for my son's wedding at City Hall in Manhattan. When we got home that evening, he said he was feeling tired and went straight to bed. Peter was a philosopher whose specialty, he also taught up in Buffalo, his specialty was the history of American philosophy, particularly American pragmatism. During the months before he died, I'd been looking at the massive collections of Jonathan Edwards' manuscripts and family papers in New Haven, because ever since working years and years ago on my book about, on Emily Dickinson, I have been drawn for some weird reason to this severe and ecstatic, maybe that's why severe and ecstatic, um, Calvinist minister. Some say our first American philosopher. Uh, he died in 1758, and I feel that Dickinson, born in 1830, inherits his voice, and both spent their lives in and around the Connecticut River Valley. William James says that in times of trauma and crisis, a door is open to a place where facts and apparitions mix. The march after Peter's death, I returned to the library to look at Edward's manuscripts again, and this time I chanced on a folder containing the private writings of his sister Hannah, and I just had this instant telepathic connection. Um, so using materials um, transcribed from her, I transcribed on my computer from her journals, along with other sources from Ovid, Hawthorne, and importantly, T.J. Clark's book on the paintings of Poussin called The Sight of Death. Um, the wonderful Poussin show was at the Met at that point. Uh, I composed the, uh, the poem or word collage called Frolic Architecture. And I'm going to read f 
first from the disappearance ab approach and then part, you know, I can only read segments to fit this in, so I'm jumping around, and then moving straight into frolic architecture, without, so I'm explaining it now. The disappearance approach. I've been reading some of W.H. Auden's The Sea in the Mirror. One beautiful sentence about the way we all reach and reach, but never touch. A skinny covering overspreads our bones, and our arms are thin wings. In an early morning half-waking dream, you were lying on the bed beside me in a dark suit. I recently touched your black jacket, the one you loved we brought together on sale two years ago in Barney's. We were thinking about getting another this month because you had worn the original to pieces. It's in the closet now, an object for storage beside your ashes. Maybe the jacket was in my mind as distant dream knowledge of the way one figure can substitute for another with a cord attached. So what is false gives life to what is fair. I thought you were really you until I woke up back in myself. Esther, 1695 through 1766. Elizabeth, 1697 through 1733. Anne, 1699 through 1790. Mary, 1701 through 1776. Jonathan, 1703 through 1758. Eunice, 1705 through 1788. Abigail, 1707 through 1764. Jerusha, 1710 through 1729. Hannah, 1713 through 1773. Lucy, 1750 through 1736, Martha, 1718 through 1794. If your names are only written and no originals exist, do you have a real existence for us? What happens to names when time stops? Answer, nothing happens. There is no when. The Connecticut Historical Society in Hartford owns a fragment of Mary Edwards' cruel embroidery and a pair of silk shoes worked by Miss Hannah Edwards, daughter of the Reverend Timothy Edwards, wife of Seth Wetmore Esquire of Middletown. Only tossing color coins into a well of language, while faces of magic contained in little stories outside the purview of philosophy scramble to help each other quid pro quo. Even if ideas don't exist without the mind, there may be copies or resemblances. I never clearly understood what academic meant in relation to philosophy's defining essence, but Peter always used the term when speaking of the structure of his intellectual life. Perhaps he was suddenly indifferent to this self-willed world of cultural symbols, intellectual historical records, competing research topics, future career trajectories, making a splash with books. C.O. Milford, PA, 1904. The way Bleak North presents itself here as Heracleitan error, driving and driving thought and austerity, nearer to lyricism, often as black ice. I wrote this poem on a winter day in 1998, when my mother was still alive and I hadn't met Peter. I had been reading Xerox copies of the last journal pages from the microform edition of the manuscripts of Charles Sanders' purse. If you take immediate environment into account, during the winter of 1904, things were threadbare for the putative father of pragmatism. No peace in projects, no firewood for warmth. A few crotchety word lists used as ornaments or phantom limbs. I remember the way the lines came to me suddenly after reading the journal and how cold and quiet it seemed inside the room with soft snow falling outside. Nietzsche says that for Heraclitus, all contradictions run into harmony 
even if they are invisible to the human eye. Lyric is transparent, as hard to see as black or glare ice. The paved roadway underneath is our search for aesthetic truth. Poetry, false in the tricks of its music, draws harmony from necessity and random play. In this aggressive age of science, sound-colored secrets unperceivable in themselves can act as proof against our fear of emptiness. Sorrows have been passed and unknown continents approached. General Manuscript 151, Box 24, Folder 1379, Hannah Edwards' Diary Fragment. My dear children, what shall I leave to you or what shall I say to you? Fain would I do something while I live that may contribute to your real benefit and advantage. Our lives are all exceeding brittle and uncertain. The Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, one of the largest buildings in the world devoted entirely to rare books and manuscripts, was constructed from Vermont marble and granite, bronze and glass during the early 1960s. The library's digital photography studio is located in a windowless room downstairs. Here, objects to be copied, according to the state-of-the-art Northlight HID copy light system, are prepared for reproduction. Each light is packed with 900 watts of ceramic discharge lamps and requires a typical 15 ampere 120 volt outlet. The lamps are doubly fan-cooled with one chamber for the hot lamp side and one fan for the electronic side. A diffusion screen spreads light evenly onto the copy board while protecting the art object or manuscript from heat. Black curtains surrounding the copy table protect the photographer's vision at the same time they prevent light intensity from bleeding. One or two stuffed oblong cloth containers known in the trade as snakes hold the volume open. Facing pages are held down flat with transparent plastic strips. And when I was out of my head and thought myself sick and lost, or at a riverside and among strangers that would not direct me home, that's Hannah Edwards remembering her delirium during an illness in 1736. Under the fan-cooled copy lights, she speaks to herself of the loneliness of being Narcissus. Art is a mystery, artifice its form. Hannah has taken off her embroidered shoes. She is dipping her bare feet in varieties of light. In Ovid's Metamorphosis, the fruit of the mulberry tree is forever turned black by the red blood of Pyramus. This is how <clears throat> Poussin introduces the narrative of love turning to misfortune into, into a composition he originally made, meant to present as merely a landscape with a storm. All the figures one sees there are playing their roles according to the weather. Some are fleeing through the dust in the direction of the wind that is driving them, them along. Others, on the contrary, are going against the wind, walking with difficulty, covering their eyes with their hands. In the foreground of the painting, one sees Pyramus lying dead on the ground, and near him Thisbe, who has succumbed to grief. Clark says that in landscape with Pyramus and Thisbe, Everything ominous in snake, landscape with a snake, um, size, scale of the figures in relation to the whole, use of light, intensity of dumb show, framing and shaping, runs over the edge into chaos. By 1650, Poussin's hands were shaking so badly he was painting through the tremors. In spite of his affliction, the surface of the lake at the center of his canvas is smooth as glass. This still eye reflects a neutral you that is me, and yet secret. 
Who can hold such mirroring cheap? It's a vital aspect of marriage and deep friendship. More and more, I have the sense of being present at a point of absence where crossing centuries may prove to be like crossing languages, sound waves. It's the difference between one stillness and another stillness. Even the invisible scotch tape I recently used when composing frolic architecture leaves traces on paper when I run each original sheet through the Canon copier. I can't remember if there was snow on the ground, but I do remember the cold. If winter landscape meets the being of the subject of the soul now and before and conveys what is yours to join the finished pastoral invention of others, that is rationalism's secret. Midas begged Bacchus to relieve him of his dangerous talent. He has gone down to the source of the Patoclus River and kneels in profile, finely cleansed of gold. He is tired, tired. In Poussin's small Ajaccio composition, yellow brushstrokes on leaves tipped by the setting sun indicate evening's reflective melancholy. There will always be people struggling for worldly power. Do we communicate in mirror languages through some inherent sense of form in every respect but touch? Do we ever know each other, know who we really are? Midas, King Midas, is the secret we take away with us, touch? Storytellers in the expanding middle class eager for professional careers, move across sites of struggle in battleground fields. We are our soul, but we haven't got the dead of it. You steal on me, you step in close to ease with soft promise your limit and absolute absence. Returning home, after only a day or two away, I often have the sense of intruding on infinite and finite local evocations and wonder how things are in relation to how they appear. This sixth sense of another reality, even in simplest objects, is what poets set out to show, but cannot once and for all. If there is an afterlife, then we still might, if not, not. Frolic architecture, that this book is a history of a shadow that is a shadow of me mystically, one in another, another, another to subserve. Nent n the der own osier land net in one. No sun, nor did the waxen yet did the cir mm, the circumamp uh, her arms alone oh, though there uh, could tread the air was dark, all objects wild things strove. In body, my body slipping, in body, my body slipping d down full toward its own secret sermon, 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 secret sermon, rough of sermon and sermon sent to. Oh, that I then be at rest more sure these uh, was shadow. Long shall ever finding no, for they but find a uh, bewildered, weary of my. That is first, then was ever, for they ever had. Had the wings of a dove, though, but whether could I fly, oh, and abiding portion, and no ring. Deceiving enjoyments, where shall I find real? I wander from mountain, huh, 
oh, that I could f rest for the soul of my, and weary myself. To. Walking just below my father's orchard after I, walking just below my father's orchard after I, religion and the concerns of my soul, my business religion and the concerns of my soul, my business prayed for and labored after an awakening sense. Tur, I had taken the, after I had taken up many res concerns of my mm, business and after I had set to it and print mm, uh, sense of my miserable, con my miserable, with, with a great deal of concern, sensible, I thought and negligent, notwithstanding so old in running over the south fence and notwithstanding to be sensible, then what made me cast about in my mind whether I was unable to do one chain of thought, I saw manner that an image of it on my mind as what should. But I attempted to read, but out one chain intercepting and covering the. I had as lively asable and did not seem to be, had seen it abruptly and so strong that it, I attempted to, to look upon it as supernatural by a piece of Cicero of imagination, and that distemper, I was seized with it. Dar, white dress, golden family thought, lived to be a street, and for her. Opening the house door, she stood hesitating, whether she ought, whether she set at great distance from this world. It then appeared to me a vain, toilsome. Batants were strangely wandered, lost, and comfort to me that I was so separate, the worldly affairs by my present affliction. Though melancholy was yet in a quiet frame, Ungers, I was in. It was not without a deep, prepared for death, and I did set myself to, wrote the Romans to, on the other hand, world. I used to be there, felt soft, or in a sort, Ridley knew who or what I was, and thereby the music up, and therefore lost, mm, I was, consulted with myself about it, and, and was ready. O the sets glade the yo O hastra tur the the This held a day or two and then began to the as yet moon rent hang poised Rift and air, nor had the far reaches ooh, at of land and uh, old or swim uh, old flew of things. Fla de fluck. I remember the summer before my sister Jerusha's death, making th and I was leaning over the south fence and thinking in this manner that I was never likely to do better, and where should I go, etc. Thank you. 